We're going to be discussing the three major dermatoses of pregnancy today. It's interesting that uh, despite the fact we're specialists in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, very often we seem to know very little about skin. We seem to relegate that to the world of the dermatologist. But in fact, uh, there are several conditions that are unique to pregnancy, and it's up to us uh, to be familiar with these conditions uh, because uh, clearly we're going to continue to encounter them as long as we're taking care of reproductive age women. This slide here serves just to make the point that there's been a, a recent reclassification of dermatologic conditions affecting pregnancy. And, and so you'll see, uh, for example, that the old name herpes gestationis has now been reclassified as pemphigoid gestationis. And this is actually a positive reclassification. It gets, word, gets rid of the word herpes, which has nothing to do with this condition and which has bad negative connotations. So um, herpes gestationis becomes pemphigoid gestationis. Uh, in a similar fashion, what we used to refer to as pyritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy, or PUP, is now known as the polymorphic eruption of pregnancy. So PUP becomes PEP. And then lastly, a, a, a large collection of a fairly wide variety of conditions, um, perigo of pregnancy, papular dermatitis of pregnancy. These are all being uh, classified under the heading of atopic eruption of pregnancy. There is a fourth uh, group, uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, but because uh, cholestasis of pregnancy typically does not have a dermatologic finding, I'm not going to discuss that today. We'll talk about that on an, at another time. Now, pemphigoid gestationis is rare. It's estimated to occur in about 1 in 50,000 uh, pregnancies. I've seen about two cases in my entire uh, lifetime, so very rare. It presents fairly late in pregnancy, sixth or seventh month, but it does have a range of presentation from nine weeks up to postpartum. Uh, it frequently recurs in subsequent pregnancies, so if you're seeing a patient with it, it's very likely she may get it again, and if she gets it again, it might come earlier, and the symptoms might be more severe. So that's a, a common finding with pemphigoid gestationis. It has been described with estrogen exposure uh, outside of pregnancy, so uh, birth control pills, for example, have been um, cited as a cause. Now, the appearance of pemphigoid gestationis uh, is characterized by these uh, wide, large, expanding plaques, but the hallmark clearly are these vesiculobullous lesions. This is where the name pemphigoid comes from. Uh, so fluid-filled um, uh, skin lesions surrounded by these wide um, erythematous plaques. So the blistering appearance can sometimes be quite dramatic. Um, so it's characterized by these intensely itchy eruptions of red papules, plaques, and vesiculobullous lesions. It often starts periumbilical, and this is a clue to the diagnosis. So it starts around the, the umbilicus and spreads to the trunk and extremities. It does not involve the face. It does not involve mucous membranes. It occurs most commonly in the second and third trimester. Um, rare that it will present postpartum, but postpartum flares are incredibly common, and so typically patients will be uh, treated with a burst of steroids postpartum to prevent a flare. Skin biopsies in this con condition are incredibly helpful because they are positive for immunofluorescent staining for complement and immunoglobulin around, along the basement membrane. This is classic for this condition, and so uh, skin biopsies are incredibly helpful um, to uh, cinch the diagnosis. Since it's antibody-mediated, there commonly can be a newborn rash, which um, affects about 5% of newborns, lasts for one to two weeks and then goes away. It doesn't really need to be treated and there's no clear association with an increase in perinatal morbidity or mortality. 
Now, Pemphigoidia sessionis has been linked to other autoimmune diseases. This makes sense. So things like Graves' disease, vitiligo, can uh, co-occur with this condition. Treatment is usually very straightforward. You can try topical steroids, but they're usually ineffective. And so quickly you move to oral steroids. Prednisone usually in the range of 20 to 80 milligrams uh, a day. <clears throat> so you usually start with a fairly high dose, increase the dose until you have symptoms under control, and then titrate down to the lowest effective dose and you can give birth steroids to treat flare-ups. Typically, you'll continue treatment for 8 to 10 weeks postpartum and then um, gradually uh, taper them off the steroids. So again, these vesiculobullous lesions are the classic hallmark of this condition. Um, some of the early eruptions can look herpetic, and this is where that name herpes gestationis came from, but there's no viral mediation here. This is autoimmune. And in some cases, it can be in, in completely widespread and uh, debilitating to the patient. Here's a, a representation on gross specimen of the uh, bullous lesion and then the immunofluorescent staining for complement along the basement membrane zone. Now we're going to shift and talk about the second dermatosis, polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, much more common, one in 5,000 uh, pregnancies. So this is something you might see a case or two a, a year here at our institution. 76% of these cases present in primogravid patients, uh, although it's generally considered to be non-recurrent, up to a fourth of patients uh, can get this in um, a... Um, in a subsequent pregnancy. It's almost exclusive to the third trimester, so it's very late presenting, and that's very helpful in making the diagnosis. So the history of presentation here is very uh, essential to uh, making this diagnosis. Um, usually it shows up around the 36th week, and a 39th week presentation is the most common. It also tends to start periumbilical and then spreads um, out to the uh, abdomen, trunk, and extremities. And it um, <clears throat> is also classic for exhibiting something known as the Kebner phenomenon. This is where a rash or lesions appear in an area of stress or trauma. So in this photograph we see um, the polymorphic lesions erupting along stretch marks. This is known as the Kebner phenomenon, and uh, the polymorphic eruption is the, is the one dermatosis of the three we're discussing that exhibits the Kebner phenomenon. So again, uh, lesions and stretch marks, uh, starting periumbilical, moving to the uh, trunk and extremities. So lesions appear on the abdomen first, often in stria, spread to the arms, legs, buttocks, breast back, the face is spared. Uh, itching with this condition is intense, but ironically, excoriations are minimal. So compare that to cholestasis, um, where patients uh, really dig at their palms and soles. I often grab a, <clears throat> the, um, the tip of a ballpoint pen or the cap of a pen and scratch themselves with it. Um, you don't tend to find excoriations with this condition. If you were to biopsy this and stain it, it would be negative uh, for immunofluorescent staining. What you would see would be these perivascular lymphohistiocytic infiltrates. Uh, newborns are typically unaffected. Uh, there is no increase in perinatal M&M. Treatment uh, can begin with topical steroids. For topical steroid failures, you move to oral prednisone. You can give a steroid dose pack or you can give low dose continuous stero steroids, whichever are needed. Now we're going to conclude by uh, discussing this third group, the atopic eruption of pregnancy. So I like to think of anything that kind of looks like um, eczema, or is very itchy and isn't included in the uh, first two conditions and it's associated with pregnancy, then think of atopic eruption of pregnancy. 
It's benign, self-limited, very itchy. There may be a, a personal and or a family history of an atopic dermatitis. Uh, clinically presents as uh, an eczematous lesion in two-thirds of case or as perigo in a third of cases. Now here we see a, uh, a, a difference in that this condition uh, often will involve the face, the neck, in addition to breast cleavage, flex, flexor surfaces, um, typical areas where, you're, where you see other atopic conditions. Treatment for this initially can be uh, moisturizers such as emollient creams and ointments and then uh, for failures topical steroids and in severe cases oral steroids. Here's an, an example and if you look at this you notice these little punctate lesions and if you were to look at them under a magnifying glass you might actually see um, a hair follicle at the site of each lesion so a folliculitis type uh, picture is very common with this atop, atopic eruption. Um, so here again, uh, the breast, breast cleavage, back, abdomen involved, but you don't necessarily get this periumbilical origin that you get with the other two. Now here's a, a summary that shows some of the um, characteristics that can help distinguish between these three conditions. Um, so if it's showing up in a prima paris patient, then think the polymorphic eruption, where 73% of these involve prima paris patients. If you, the patient tells you, I had this identical condition in my last pregnancy, then think atopic um, dermatitis. If it shows up um, extremely early, like especially if it's in the first trimester, then think um, atopic eruption of pregnancy. So although the range of, of, of presentation can be wide for all three of these, um, the atopic uh, dermatitis is the one that shows up the earliest. And then lastly, abdominal involvement. Uh, these are characteristic of both uh, pemphigoid gestationis and the polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, but not so much of the atopic eruption. So that's it. Just remember we'll be seeing skin on all of our patients and we should become familiar with these uh, dermatologic conditions uh, that are unique to pregnancy. Uh, and so I hope you found this review uh, helpful.